Sonic the Hedgehog for the Sega Master System and Sega Game Gear is really hecking weird, even for its time period. Released in the same year as the one on the Genesis slash Mega Drive, for some reason the company felt the need to make an 8-bit counterpart on the Master System. Yeah, the previous generation's console. I suppose they really wanted to milk this IP for all it's worth, and who'd blame them? The first one sold like fricking hotcakes. While on the surface, this game seems like a simplified port, with most of the assets, enemies and mechanics reused, there's probably more to it than meets the eye, considering it was released twice. But did Sonic the Hedgehog really have to be passed around the console table like a hot, gimmicky potato? Well, no use beating around the bush. Uh, let's give Sonic the Hedgehog 8-Bit a good look. The conception of this Sonic spin-off started like all good things do, with family gatherings. Place yourself in this moment, let's say the mid to late 1980s. Do you remember the Master System and Game Gear? Two 8-bit systems on home console and handheld respectively? Well, Sega did. Regardless of how poorly they sold, thanks to Nintendo completely owning the global console industry. Sonic the Hedgehog was already a huge success on the Genesis, their recent gaming platform, so the higher-ups wanted to recapture that success with Sonic the Hedgehog. Yeah, they, they share the same name, so for simplicity, I shall be referring to this as Sonic 8-Bit for the remainder of this video. Whether Sonic 8-Bit holds up as well as its 16-bit counterpart is uh, up for debate, but hold on to your horses, because the history behind this game is probably the most eye-opening aspect of the entire package. Ancient were the ones who developed the game, uh, not their ages, uh, that's the name, and it was founded by the game's composer, Yuzo Koshiro, the dude behind the OSTs of Streets of Rage and Revenge of Shinobi, the Mega CD version of Eye of the Beholder, and the musical jingles used in Masahiro Sakurai's YouTube series, funnily enough. He does very impressive chiptune compositions in Sonic 8-Bit, and this was the first game he ever personally developed, too. Cheers to this dude and the two other people who initially formed the company. Ayano, his sister, who acted as director and graphic designer for this game, and Tomo, their mum, doing behind-the-scenes stuff. All things considered, that's an inspiring family business right there. It's a whole family of creative people. It wasn't going to be a complete port onto this tiny thing, because such programming and brainstorming would have run the developers ragged. Some beloved features had to be cut, which must have been a lot of pressure on the team. Koshiro himself admitted the prospects to be really challenging, but him and the rest were encouraged by Sega, as they had a lot of faith in the dude and his connections. Shall I talk about the box art? <laughs> I kind of want to talk about the box art. It's something I missed out in the first video, so... Woo, quick recap, um, the Japanese box art for the first Sonic game is really good. <laughs> it's really eye-popping, and I love the Sonic art there. The European box art is my personal fave, it's, it's the one I had growing up. Sonic is front and centre, with the white background of, like, carcasses of Robotnik and little animals back there. But <laughs> you know how in North American box art they tend to make them look more, like, hardcore and edgy? Look at this! <laughs> Sonic is the- he's got more attitude than he does in the entire game here. But yeah, mad props to the artist, the, the late and great Greg Martin. On his resume, he did a lot of game covers during this era, and Sonic is no exception. They brought him back to do both the North American and the European box art for Sonic 8-Bit, and while I never grew up with the game, as corny as it is illustrated, I just really love the style, the brush strokes, the shading, the- it's all very good. <laughs> It just encapsulates the 90s for me. And thus was the intriguing creation behind this tumultuous port. I'll take this moment to talk about the gameplay, and then its various changes from the Genesis original. Buckle up, peeps. Despite its origin as an attempt at a straight-up port, Sonic 8-Bit plays both very similarly and very differently to its counterpart most of the changes adding to the original's already steep difficulty. For instance, you can't see much around you. The draw distance, if you can call it that, doesn't allow you to see enemies or obstacles until they're right up in your face. It's fine in the more simple stages, but with ones in like an open world it's... Uh, didn't see that coming. <laughs> Silly me. Sonic runs a little slower than usual this time around, except when he rolls down any slope. 
Now the overall game is slow paced and rather maze heavy in the level design. In terms of set pieces, there is a distinct lack of loop de loops and other video gamey structures to platform around, possibly due to limitations of the system. However, there are a couple of momentum based things Sonic can utilise, such as ramps seen in a couple of zones. Though, use them at your own risk, <laughs> you never know where exactly you'll be landing. Seesaw's return, this time having a weight on one side, and not requiring Sonic to mosey on over to the other side to work them. They are limited to one zone, and be careful not to overshoot your jump and land in the river by accident. I would classify springs as more of an obstacle than a helpful way to traverse the levels in this game. Not only do they send you to areas you cannot yet perceive as safe, and are counterintuitive to the zoomed in screen, but they are mostly positioned in areas where they can immediately screw you over, making you backtrack, fall off ledges, send you to your demise, or all three. Why is this spring here? Why is this spring here? Why is this spring here? As far as I'm aware, they're Robotnik's traps for all I care. For obstacles, spikes are still a plenty, which can be a bit of a problem with your small range of sight. One second you could reach a pit or a dip in the path, and there's a whole carpet of the things. You can't even touch spikes from the sides, as their damage box now extends to the whole thing. Oh, one thing I didn't mention in the last video is the time overs. They are basically a game over, but involving the timer. You see the numbers in the corner of the screen? Yeah, that's not just to give you a bonus at the end for completing the level fast enough. If that thing hits 10 minutes, Sonic freaking dies immediately, leaving you to either start the level again at the last checkpoint, or get a game over. There is no way to avoid this. Time really is a freedom-loving hedgehog's greatest weakness, I guess. Rings reappear as a really rewarding pickup, their placement being a very useful guide through claustrophobic stages. When the hedgy boy gets injured, he loses all of his rings, but only one shows up because the frame rate would take a hit otherwise. It's a non-interactable effect this time around, you can't collect it to regain an extra hit. Believe me, I tried. With the rings no longer being needed for anything other than points, and the fact that you cannot regather them when struck, it doesn't give you much incentive to collect them in bulk. Getting a hundred of them still gets you an extra life, and also resets your ring counter for some reason. But that's way harder to do in this game due to the sheer number of ways your bollocks can get blown off. The boss battles against the recurring mad scientist are completely altered. There are zero rings in boss zones, meaning the moment any stray projectile touches you, or if Sonic grazes the boss a little bit, it equals a one-hit kill. Some of these unique fights are for the better, like when he goes into a kind of submarine at the end of water-themed zones, it's already more aesthetically pleasing than just the Eggmobile again. And some for the worst, where his only weapon during the boss fight is ramming into Sonic. At least the final boss is a new sight. Along with shields, rings, power sneakers and 1-ups and the like, item boxes can also contain an orange arrow, saving your progress and acting as a replacement to the star posts. You have to re-break them every time you respawn though, I definitely prefer the lamp posts. Special stages also work differently, in that while they are still only accessible at the end of a zone, instead of hopping through a giant ring which disappears in a flash of light, the newly introduced bonus panel will spin about and randomly land on a different image, each of which determines what you get. If it's a ring, you get 10 rings, the goofy looking Sonic, a 1-up, Dr. Robotnik, nothing, and it feels really weird that we're helping him mark his territory. And an exclamation point, which takes you to a special stage. Its iteration this time around is a vibrantly coloured realm with a purplish night sky, its blocky landscape lined with springs and those fun bumpers that bounce you in every direction known to man. The multitude of rings here allow you to get extra lives, and reaching the end gets you extra goodies from another bonus panel, or, or it'll just land on Dr. Robotnik again. Oh no, he owns space! Last to mention are the emeralds, all blue in colour. The sparkly dimensions are not where you get the Chaos Emeralds this time around, instead the six are found lying around each of the zones. One for each zone, and six because the seventh emerald had not been conceptualised yet. You would think this would make it easier for the badniks to steal, considering they're left out in the open, sometimes in places that are hard to reach, or just… questionable. 
Pain and reward, baby! When Sonic collects any of these, a fun little fanfare plays that I honestly cannot get enough of. When collecting all of them, you officially get the good ending after defeating the final boss. Speaking of which, may as well get into the story and all of the zones you go through. Ever the simple narrative, the story is very much the same. Dr. Robotnik is mucking up South Island with pollution in his search for the Chaos Emeralds, and Sonic has to stop him, this time running through a fair number of different locations with three acts each. Although, a quick mention, I love the world map between every act. This visual and the, the port as a whole really solidifies South Island as an actual place with naturalistic locations, and it's here that we see that the Scrap Brain Factory is located up in the mountainscape. They would reuse this visual as the menu that represents Sonic 1 in Sonic Origins. Robotnik also flies in to say hi whenever you reach a boss act. Now is when I'll cut the background music and play the level's respective themes, because these 8-bit compositions freaking slap. It starts out in Green Hill Zone with its familiar checkered soil and bouncy music, one of the few times the music tracks from the 16-bit version makes a comeback. While not flourishing in fields of flowers this time around, the 8-bit view of the mountains and shimmering water is still a nice touch. The second act mostly takes place in a watery underground cavern. Following that is Bridge Zone, a large number of ledges connected by rickety wooden planks across a long, dangerous river. This is the point where I really appreciate these replacement levels for showcasing the more natural aspects of South Island's locales. The music is positive and catchy, as if encouraging you through sights and obstacles not yet known. An added visual detail I appreciate are the mountains and lush jungles in the background, foreshadowing soon-to-be-visited locations. Act 2 is an auto-scroll section that admittedly kind of sucks. It's the only one in the game, and it really drags. Gotta go slow for no reason at all. Jungle Zone, a treetop area filled with curved vine platforms and perilous waterfalls which drop down logs to hop onto. It thankfully lacks an auto-scroll section, but it does have one where you climb up a waterfall and the floor below you suddenly becomes a death pit if you accidentally slip up. <laughs> Worth mentioning, this gimmick was entirely dropped in the Game Gear port. The level is lush and green, and very visually appealing, even more so in the Game Gear port with the added fruits in the bushes. This level's theme is my favourite overall, and next to another one we'll hear later. Labyrinth Zone, the familiar, nightmare-inducing caverns filled with water. The music is replaced with a less cheerful but still bouncy beat, but that's the only positive I have to give. The game already experiences slowdown if too many objects are on screen at once, but I hope you're ready for INTENTIONAL SLOWDOWN! The above water sections are fine enough to traverse through, but underwater, things are very slow, very frustrating, and the probability of air bubbles appearing is entirely random. They either appear a lot, uh, never at all, or maybe it can be like with me here, where I waited on the spot for an air bubble to appear, only to die the moment one came into existence. The use of spikes in this zone makes it just as hostile and irritating to traverse through. And in the boss act, why are there so many of these on this side path, which are very easy to die to, only to have an extra life at the end anyway? You have to be pixel perfect with these jumps, so it's a waste to even try. <laughs> it's a soggy iteration of an already unpleasant level, if you ask me. Scrap Brain Zone, the familiar industrial size. Or as I like to call it, Robotnik's fricking Disco Palace. The first act is full of traps and conveyor belts to be cautious about, although you can easily fly past them before their damage boxes turn on. Acts 2 and 3 are mazes, however, with multiple paths, switches, and puzzles to do to make the way forward work. It also includes some aspects from the Genesis original, like the Bullhog slopes, but the last act is such a slog. It's like Robotnik is literally treating you like a lab rat going through fricking mazes. And you don't even fight him at the end. He wants out, even in his own fortress, it seems. At least the music gets you pumped, and is probably my second favourite in the game. The more I listen to it, though, the more it sounds like a Mega Man level rather than a Sonic one. In a surprising twist, the Big Bad flees to Sky Base Zone, a giant airship situated in the polluted smog above the factory, surrounded by construction girders and defensive turrets. God, I, I love the blue hues added to everything. 
this zone is notable for having multiple distinct level themes and music tracks. Uh, in incoming seizure warning, but I'll do my best to soften it. Act 1 reuses the music from Scrap Brain and has the place littered with gem shapes that produce a harmful grid of electricity whenever lightning flashes. Act 2 has its own music and takes place on the Zeppelin itself, which has Sonic avoid more cannons, harmful propellers, and holding back air sickness as the level slowly rises and falls on the screen. After beating up Dr. Robotnik in his trap chamber, he makes his escape via a teleporter with Sonic in tow. Like a minute later, he nonchalantly flies around Green Hill, with Sonic having followed him and he decks him immediately. I guess he kind of forgot about him. Depending on if the Chaos Emeralds were collected or not, this nets you one of two endings. Either the island is left as is with Robotnik's pollution, or the Emerald's curious power wipes away the entirety of the billowing smog from the island, leaving it relatively clean if not for the remains of his factory on the top, not to mention the airship that might still be around. Either way, we see Sonic singing to us in the credits, which may or may not be a reference to his unused rock band. Speaking of which... Our Blue Boy Sonic is still the same, even on the Master System. He's just a little bit more pixely. In terms of looks, he is a little bit limited, because he doesn't have all of his animations. Though he still has his idol one, and that art used in the credits. But the cute hopping graphic on the company screen certainly makes up for it in the Game Gear version. It's probably the most wholesome thing I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> He's so giddy! I think the only missing animations are the pushing frames when you bump into something, and the one you see when he reaches a cliff. Dr. Robotnik is still the evil bad guy that shows up in his floating pod, including his appearances on the world map screen. Like previously mentioned, all fights in his Eggmobile are changed from the original, but what they lack in depth, they make up for with relatively simple but satisfying to master strategies, barring just a hint of repetitiveness. Because of how much they might clutter the screen, the little animals do not pop out of badniks when they are blown up. They only appear in capsules at the end, once again varied in type depending on what zone they're freed in. Speaking of badniks, the enemies in this game are all relatively the same, save for their lack of a living power source. Because Marble, Spring Yard, and Starlight Zone were omitted, some make appearances in the new zones due to their original ones not having been ported over. Uh, let's go over them one more time. Motobugs are way smaller and faster than before, making them a little trickier to deal with. They only appear in the first act of Green Hill Zone. Crab meats are unchanged in attack pattern, and appear in Green Hill and Jungle Zone. Buzz Bombers are also unchanged, and appear in Green Hill and Bridge Zone. Spikeses take on a much more crab-like appearance thanks to their heads being orange, and they appear in Bridge Zone. Choppers leap up and down from rivers and bridges, and only appear in the zone with bridges in it. Neutrons have the coloration of their rocket types, but they spit out a projectile like the yellow ones. They only appear in Jungle Zone. Both versions of Orbanaut return, though their coloration is different. The Unidasu that send their spike balls at Sonic appear in Labyrinth Zone, and the more passive Uni Uni appear in Act 1 of Sky Base Zone. Jaws still slowly swim about back and forth underwater, and only appear in Labyrinth Zone. Borobots are a little more aggressive in that they roll after Sonic instead of simply moving forward. They appear in Labyrinth Zone. Caterpillars are virtually unchanged, and they only appear in Scrap Brain Zone. Ball hogs still toss bouncy balls up at Sonic, and they are seen in Act 2 of Scrap Brain Zone. And lastly, bombs. They are smaller in size, but still explode into projectiles after a short timer. They appear in Sky Base Zone. With most of the game explained, I may as well end it off with something fans are way more familiar with. The Game Gear port. The Sonic 8-bit port for the Sega Game Gear came out two months after the original Master System release. Because of the even smaller screen size and resolution, there are many corners cut, but it's still well worth mentioning as some of these changes either address issues or <laughs> introduce new ones. For one thing, to make platforming easier, Sonic's sprite is made smaller and his physics are a little more floaty to compensate for the trickier platforming challenges. On the downside, <laughs> Homeboy's nose is missing completely on his sprites. There are little warning signs added to alert the player of upcoming danger, placed around the various zones, which have slightly altered colour palettes or, in the case of Labyrinth Zone, completely redone level layouts. 
The boss fights against Dr. Robotnik are either extremely easy or have the complete opposite effect. Because of how compact the screen is, the Big Bad is now physically in range of Sonic's spin attack, making the previously tricky boss battles a ton easier now that he can't float out of reach for most of it. The Bridge and Labyrinth Zone bosses also had their arenas adjusted to fit the screen, but it honestly doesn't make it any easier, as projectiles are still hard to avoid, if not more so. It definitely turns the Bridge Zone boss into my arch nemesis when I was a kid. It was so freaking hard, dude. Sonic 8-Bit has been ported multiple times over the years, mostly as a little bonus feature. In Sonic Adventure DX Director's Cut, the Game Gear version is playable in the minigame menu, unlocked after finishing the first 20 missions or collecting 20 emblems. This was the game I was personally introduced to Sonic 8-Bit. This port was also included in the compilation game, Sonic Mega Collection Plus. The original Master System version would be a part of the officially licensed Tech Toys plug and play console, the Tech Toy Master System 3. It was released exclusively in Brazil, so that's probably why I don't know much about it. <laughs> the Master System version would be re released on the Virtual Console for the Nintendo Wii for the steep price of 500 points, and the Game Gear version would be re released on the Virtual Console for the Nintendo 3DS for the price of 300 points. A much more reasonable price, really. Funnily enough, the Wii Virtual Console one was the first time the game got re-released in Japan. The Game Gear version would once again be re-released, this time in the black Game Gear Micro alongside other titles on the system, and that same port would be included in Sonic Origins Plus, allowing a whole new generation to enjoy the game up until the second boss. It's interesting that they never really settled on consistently re-releasing one version, instead alternating between the Master System and Game Gear versions throughout the years. Why not just make a new version with all of the good features intact, with some bells and whistles added? Well, if Sega ain't gonna do it, why not turn to the fandom? The community has remembered Sonic 8-Bit well, mainly through its original zones and music. Naturally, modders and fan game creators would try to bring Bridge Zone and the like into 16-bit form, including remixing the music with that generation's funky sound font. Don't underestimate the original songs, it's quite possibly one of the most famous things about the game. In terms of fan-made content, one thing to note is a very ambitious remake of the whole game for Sage 2014, I believe officially known as Sonic the Hedgehog Game Gear slash Master System Remake. It lifted every zone and item and enemy placement and incorporated them into the more well-known Genesis aesthetic. There's none of that slowdown, so the game plays faster than you might think with the old level layout, and the special stages are instead tricky obstacle courses. Even the Robotnik fights are different, with a remix of the 8-bit boss music. I, I won't go into every detail, <laughs> this fan remake is honestly well worth playing yourself. There is also Sonic SMS Remake, made by Creative Araya, which features a bunch of quality of life updates, playable characters, and widescreen support. It has the same aesthetic and levels as Sonic 8-Bit, and is a much more expanded adventure. Lastly, there also exists a hack named Sonic Genesis, made by some peep with the username Slogra, which is instead a version of Sonic 8-Bit with all of its features tweaked to make it look and sound closer to the original. Although, sadly this comes at the cost of the new zones being replaced by the old ones. Uh, kinda. Bridge Zone's level layout is used, except with Marble Zone's graphics, which is an interesting way to bring back that cut zone, though that means you get to see choppers jumping out of the lava now. The same goes for Jungle Zone's layout with Spring Yard Zone, though the piranhas are curiously replaced with roller badniks. Even the climactic sky base zone is just Starlight Zone's look, which doesn't quite fit as well as a final level, but I still commend the effort. It's a hack, not a fan game. Oh god, the flashing lightning is still here. Ah! And that's Sonic the Hedgehog 8-bit. All in all, a tough, more precise platformer with a little less meat on its bones, but still something myself and others think of fondly. Obviously I would recommend the 16-bit version, but if you're that big of a fan of Green Hill Zone and want to see more of Sonic and South Island and want a bit more difficulty in your Sonic game, then this is the game for you. Compared to like the first game's B rank, I would rate Sonic 8-bit a C? Yeah, that's right, that sounds about right. <laughs> That's enough 8-bit stuff for now. Next time, I'm going to analyse Sonic the Hedgehog 2, the 16-bit version. 
thank you ever so much for watching, if indeed you still are, and I will see you in the next video. Lol.